Thanks a million. At the risk of stating the perfectly obvious, you see a lot of messed up things working as a uniformed police officer. It's like the potluck of policing. Homicide knows what to expect, vice knows what to expect, but when it comes to uniform, you just don't know what's coming your way. I've seen some of the most humbling, awe-inspiring things a man could ever witness on some random middle-of-the-day calls, but I've also seen the absolute worst that people can do to each other. After working many calls like that, I learned that I could divide them up into two basic categories. There's the stuff that made me mad, and the stuff that made me sad. I'm sure you can imagine the kinds of things I'm talking about. I'd rather not rake over old coals, and this comment doesn't need to be any longer than it needs to be, so I'll just cut to the chase. It took a year or two, but I learned that there was a third category, something distinctly different to the sadness or anger that I felt after other calls. I've decided on different words for it over the years, but recently I've settled on haunting. Some of the stuff you see literally haunts you, and I don't think I need to believe in the supernatural to apply that word. There are ghosts you truly never are able to get rid of, ghosts that bring on all the cliches of seeing them whenever you close your eyes, hearing their voices whenever things get a little too quiet, or having them visit you in dreams that shift to nightmares before you wake up in a cold sweat. I don't particularly want to revisit all the things that haunt me. They got no problems visiting me all on their own, but I will tell you about the first. One morning, me and my partner had this detective come talk to us about a missing persons case. The focus was on this guy's common-law wife because she'd failed to report him missing. The guy's boss ended up calling it in, and by the time we got involved, there were strong suspicions that she was hiding something. She'd refused to allow a search of the house that she and her husband had lived in, so after securing a warrant, the detective asked me and my partner to conduct the search. We didn't need to consent to search the house, so we just waited until there was nobody home, took the back door off its hinges, and then proceeded to take a look around. The back door led right into the kitchen, which looked totally normal, but then as we walked into the ground floor's main corridor, we started to smell it. You learn to recognize the scent of death the moment it touches your nostrils, and all you have to do is find out where it's strongest, and bingo, you know where to look. The stench was its most gag-worthy in the upstairs bedroom, apparently where the woman had been sleeping the whole time, and after poking and prodding a suspiciously full-looking suitcase, we unzipped it and found our detective's missing person. I can see the look on the guy's face as clearly as the words on the screen here. He died, terrified. The last moments of his life were wracked with such a desperate hopelessness that it twisted his face up into a kind of death mask. His eyes were all wide, mouth agape in a desperate final attempt to get some oxygen, and the fact that he was curled up like a fetus just made the whole thing even creepier. Opening that case was like a sick parody of childbirth, but the question remained, how did he get in there in the first place? We drove over to the female's place of employment, put her in cuffs, and then took her down to the sheriff's office so the state detective could question her. I heard she continued to deny any knowledge for a while, but she cracked in the end, and the truth, or whatever version of the truth she gave us, all came spilling out. It turns out the deceased male was a total piece of work. He had priors for a whole bunch of financial crimes but the most pertinent to his untimely demise were a slew of domestic battery arrests. He was never formally charged for anything, but considering it's not uncommon for the victim to drop charges in cases like that, his record painted a very clear picture. He was beating the life out of his long-term partner, 
and he'd been doing it for a depressing amount of time. Now while this might explain why his wife felt contempt towards her husband, it still doesn't explain how she got him in the suitcase. I mean, the guy wasn't a giant or anything, but she was built like a field mouse. Unless it was at gunpoint, there was no way that she could have gotten him into that suitcase if he didn't already want to climb into it himself. And this is where the story gets really weird and really dumb. Over the past few years, the husband had been running some kind of pharmaceutical scam by driving up to Canada, buying bulk amounts of drugstore items, and then driving back south of the border to sell them. This is technically legal, but you need permits to import pharmaceuticals, and even if you get one, you can only bring a certain amount back over the border. Apparently, the husband gets caught doing this, but the Canadians just let him go with a slap on the wrist after only confiscating the illegal portion of his haul. But then... The reason he only gets a slap on the wrist is because the Canadians hand him a lifetime ban from entering their country. The guy's devastated, as his little scam was a huge earner for him, but for some reason, he can't just send anyone else to purchase his hauls, so he has to think of a way to smuggle himself into Canada. The plan was that just before he and his wife got to the border, the husband would climb into the suitcase and have his wife zip it up. I could then breeze through the border checkpoint and back again without ever alerting the authorities. Then, to test the plan, the husband buys a suitcase, brings it home, climbs inside it, and gets his wife to close it up. It's almost a perfect size. The guy fits in there all snug, but not so it looks like there's a person inside. It looks like their plan might actually work, but when the husband asks his wife to unzip the case, she freezes. She realizes that for the first time in God knows how long, she's in no danger of being beaten up by him. She's the one who's in control, not him, and I can imagine the feeling must have been pretty overwhelming for someone in her position. She told the missing persons detective that she just went for a walk so that she didn't have to listen to him scream. A long walk too, didn't return home till after dark. But then, her husband was quiet and he didn't make a noise again. That was four days before we searched her house, and then by the end of the month, she was in prison on a voluntary manslaughter conviction. The judge gave her around ten years, but I know she'll be released after less than half of that. If I'm honest, I don't think that's even a bad thing. If it took years of abuse to get her to snap like that, I reckon the rest will be just fine if we pay her a little common courtesy. Besides, if there's one thing that being a cop has taught me, is that pieces of trash like suitcase guy are all living on borrowed time. If this old lady didn't get him, someone else would have, and I certainly wouldn't have minded it being me. Back when I was a teenager, my mom and I would often walk our dogs around our neighborhood in the evenings, we did this almost every night, walking a few blocks to the dog park and back. We always felt very safe too, as the streets around the neighborhood I used to live in are well lit and policed. This one evening, we were standing on said green space, letting the dog sniff off leash as we chatted when I suddenly saw a large car coming down the road towards us. I could only see its headlights at first, and I couldn't figure out why it had caught my attention for a moment, but then I realized... It was driving on the wrong side of the street, and it was driving very fast. I'm just about to motion to my mom when I hear this big roar of an engine, tires screeching and everything. The car had driven onto the small dog park and was heading directly in our direction. I screamed and yelled at my mom to run, grabbing our smaller dog into my arms before I ran. I honestly thought that one of us might die that night, and to think the dogs might get hurt too... That makes me tear up just to think about, even all this time later. We were only saved by two things. The direction we ran, and the fact that a metal signpost just so happened to be in between us and the car. He had to swerve to keep aiming for us, and I don't think he saw the metal post until it was way too late to do anything about it. One of their back tires gets caught on the pole, and I look back in time to see what happened. Let me tell you. It was wild to see a car buck upwards and at the same time kind of yank sideways by the force of smashing under the post. 
I still stand on the belief that the sign saved our lives, that and the grass that made him drift a little. It gave us a window of time to run into the alley. I didn't look back as we ran, but I heard their engine and wheels going to get loose and it was terrifying. We ended up running into our neighbor's yard where we hid, crouched down, and seconds later there are headlights lighting up the alleyway as the car slows into it. It passes by us and comes around twice again as he looped the neighborhood looking for us. We just sat, silent and frozen with fear in that yard for what seemed like a half hour until we couldn't hear the engine anymore. I don't know if the driver was drunk or something, but it was scary having someone use their vehicle as a weapon to try and mow you down for no reason at all. When we contacted the authorities, the police couldn't do much about it either, as we didn't get a good look at the guy's license plate or his car because we were basically running away from him the entire time. I kind of hope he was a drunk driver, because in the end, he'd get caught for it. But then maybe he tried to hurt someone again, and maybe that time he was successful. I don't want to think of the kind of damage that he could do to someone, especially if they didn't see it coming at all. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5am each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot were never on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone on this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys my brain in the process of turning off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering. Her body language was the exact definition, run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement, through the span of trees that separates the resort from the outside world. She was directly in front of my car and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair and was wearing a jacket with pajamas, maybe like she just walked out of the house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it was a normal gesture at this time and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it'd stay locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back to the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told this story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police and I regret that. 
I'll never get out of my brain, though, how freaking off that feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness, laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there, and where exactly. Many years ago, I was in love with a very damaged person. He'd grown up in an ultra-Orthodox religious community, what some people might refer to as a cult. He'd departed its ranks a long time before we met, and he'd undergone a great deal of therapy too. When I met him, you'd never have guessed from how well he was dealing with all of his issues, but over the course of our relationship, the truth came out, and I became aware of how much fixing needed to be done. He'd been removed from an unhealthy setting, but the unhealthy attitudes hadn't been removed from him, and after a while, that became a huge problem, especially for me. After we ran into a little financial trouble, his mental health began to steadily decline, and then one night, I get home from work and he tells me there is evil in our house, and we have to leave with the dogs now. He was acting completely unhinged, and I got so worried on multiple levels. I wouldn't let him drive because of how frantic he was being, but he insisted on going to his sister's and then a friend's, so I drove us instead. He ends up directing me to drive to these old hiking and biking BMX trails behind a closed fast food chain restaurant. He adamantly wants me to get out with him to go down the trails. I say absolutely not. He starts praying and speaking in tongues, I guess, and talking about a demon in our house. I cried and tried to talk him down. It took hours and when we got back I knew our relationship could never recover and I made moves to leave everything I had made for myself during that relationship. I left. Me and my dog couch surfed at my friend's house and her stepmom's house for a few weeks before I could figure out what to do next. In that moment, I knew if I got out of that car I would end up dead on some random trail in Washington and my family would not know what happened to me and I'd never been so scared in my life. Becoming a father was the best thing that's ever happened to me. Me and my ex-wife were in our early 20s when we found out that she was pregnant and we were completely unprepared to be parents. But since my wife's side of the family is very Catholic, termination really wasn't an option. I was very much in love with her at the time so I decided, hey, why not give being a dad a try? The relationship didn't work out but we're not like the stereotypical divorced couple who hate each other. We learned to co-parent effectively was still very close in some ways and our daughter was always happy and healthy. That all changed when she entered her teenage years and it culminated in one of the most terrifying, rage-inducing moments of my life. I appreciate that all kids go through emotional changes when they become teenagers, so me and my daughter's mom were more than prepared for that. But what we noticed pretty quick was that our daughter's behavior grew far more concerning than the other girls in her age group. I'm pretty sure that she'd ream me out if I doxed her name, so I'll just call her daughter for the time being. Daughter was always different, but me and her mom were always different too. I wouldn't say we were goth, but we flirted with the aesthetic, and our daughter was regularly exposed to music that we liked, so she grew up liking it a lot too. Because she wasn't like a lot of the other girls in her classes, she sometimes had trouble making friends, but she knew how to make them anyways, so she got by. But then she starts high school... We upgrade her to a smartphone and that's when the problems really began. Myself and her mom had always been in total agreement when it came to phones and we also heavily policed her access on the internet. Being younger, more computer savvy parents, we were both able to set up content blockers to make sure that she couldn't access anything inappropriate. We also made sure that she only ever had a flip phone as phone addiction among kids was already a worry by that time but Obviously, we still needed a way of getting in touch with her if she was out of the house. That changed when she entered high school. Our daughter had been begging us for an iPhone for over two years by that time, and me and her mother relented when we realized that it might well serve us as a study aid, you know? And we also just didn't want her missing out on all the other smartphone-related stuff, as more and more things required apps and whatnot to operate them. 
Sorry to take you on a detour of our logic, but that's just the way we thought. So on the birthday before we started high school, we bought her an iPhone. As you can probably guess, she was completely and utterly smitten with the thing, but was so grateful that she stuck to our rules surrounding it. She didn't bring it to the dinner table, and she didn't take it to bed with her, and she didn't run up any crazy charges buying games or apps or music. But by the middle of her freshman year, when her depression and anxiety were getting worse and worse, the phone became like an extra limb to her. She was never off the thing, and I found myself having to fork out more and more money each month just to keep up with all the data that she was eating up. Her thumbs were tapping against that freaking screen from the moment she woke up, and she kept music or videos playing even when she was asleep. I'm pretty attached to my phone too, but as someone who didn't grow up with that kind of tech, I started to find it pretty alarming after a while. But then our daughter started doing things that made her phone addiction look very unhealthy, and her mother and me knew that we had to intervene. I don't necessarily agree with these sorts of things, but out of respect for my daughter, I'm going to offer a trigger warning for self-harm for what I'm about to say next. Basically, I got a call from her mother one day to say that she was cutting. To those unfamiliar with the implications of the term, cutting refers to when a person inflicts physical harm on themselves, usually with a blade, but sometimes with very hot or very cold things like hot lighters or a cube of ice. I know those two things aren't strictly cutting, but it all falls under the same umbrella, I guess. I know all this because I personally attended some of the counseling sessions that we paid for our daughter to attend, all to get a better understanding of what was going on. They were expensive, but I can honestly say that they were worth every single penny because they helped us to get to the root of the problem which potentially saved our daughter's life. After the fifth session, the counselor asked if she could have a quiet word alone with me. With my daughter waiting in the car, the counselor explained how she believed part of the problem was my daughter's social circle. I knew she had a couple of friends in high school, plus this one other girl that she still talked to from middle school, but they all seemed like sweet enough girls, so I wasn't sure what the problem could be. That's when the counselor explained that my daughter appeared to have been indoctrinated. Now I know to a lot of you that term sounds a lot like brainwashing, which I obviously found deeply alarming, but in the true sense of the word it just means taught. My daughter was saying things during the sessions that she certainly wasn't being taught in high school, and when I heard them, I could assure the counselor she wasn't learning them at home either. It might seem very cliche, but the long and short of it was, life is suffering, the only relief is pain and eventually death. That's probably a wild oversimplification of what she was actually being told, although that's just about sums up the effect that it had on her, but it's all kind of besides the point. The issue was that she didn't arrive at cutting on her own. Someone had coached her to do it, and it was the view of the counselor that my daughter was communicating with this person via her cell phone. During the majority of this period, I was working crazy shifts, six nights a week, trying to keep my business going, and sometimes I had to travel for a few days at a time to promote in other parts of the country. As a result, my daughter spent the vast majority of her time with my ex and only occasionally came to stay with me on weekends. So when it came to checking her phone for any worrying texts, it was solely down to her mom at first. After failing to find any worrying text messages, I told her mom to check all of her social media, her browsing history, everything. And this caused one heck of a fight from what I heard. But in the end, she got the job done and she went through all of her daughter's messages. It wasn't our proudest moment as parents, no one ever wants to violate their child's privacy, especially when having personal space starts to mean a lot more, but I don't think we had any other choice, and when all was said and done, we were vindicated. Her mom couldn't find anything. There were one or two worrying posts, and our daughter seemed to have a very concerning interest in pharmaceutical drugs, but there was no smoking gun in terms of someone having a bad influence on her. I told my ex not to worry too much and to keep an eye on our kid until I could take a look at her phone myself. Maybe a week or so later she comes over to stay for the weekend and after she goes to bed one night, minus her phone of course, I take a look through it. Everything seemed pretty sterile and I figured that she was on her best behavior to keep her mom sweet but then as I'm exploring the apps on her phone, I notice something about her app store searches. The top search the thing that came up as soon as you tapped the search bar was something called K 
kick. I'd spent enough time going through my own app store to know that it was some kind of messaging app and it finally dawned on me why it was in her top searches. She was downloading it, then deleting it, and she was doing it so often that her phone remembered it. I knew I was onto something when the app remembered her login details and all I had to do was click the lime green sign in button to go into her account. There was only one chat box, a conversation with a user named IXTab. And I'll never forget that name, mainly because I didn't think that it meant anything at first, when it turned out to have a chilling significance to it. Besides, I was far too distracted with the walls and walls of text than by the username, at least at first anyway. I can honestly say that some of the things this person was saying to my daughter was some of the most frighteningly violent and viscerally disturbing things I'd ever read in my entire life, and the fact that they were directed at my one and only child just ramped everything up by a thousand. I didn't read everything in detail, I just skimmed through it, picking up portions here and there to give myself an idea of what their conversations were about. There was a lot of talk about self-harm and hurting yourself, and even in the parts where the conversation just seemed casual and small-talky, this person's attitude was just dripping with pessimism. Or maybe pessimism is the wrong word, it was more like a relentless poisonous negativity and they tried to inject it into every aspect of my daughter's life. Another reason I skimmed through it was to try to find evidence of grooming. That was my one big fear, but there was nothing of the sort, at least not on an age-appropriate level. Instead, another kind of thing was going on, one where this mystery person was urging my 14-year-old daughter to take her own life. It was sickening, and from the way this person wrote, they didn't seem that much older than she was, they used the same slang words, seemed to have the same points of reference, but there was an eerie sort of deliberateness to it, almost like they were older, much older, and had learned how to talk to teenagers like that. To say my skin crawled would be the understatement of the millennium. I felt sick, and I immediately called my ex to inform her that I'd found the source of the problem. Together we confronted our daughter and demanded to know who this IX tab person was, she claimed to have no idea of their true identity, but that didn't go over well with me at first. I had to go back and read through all the messages again to realize she was actually telling the truth. They met on social media and had switched to a different messaging app pretty quickly and although my daughter had sometimes asked this IX tab personal questions, the replies had always been vague at best. Me and my ex then demanded to see this person's social media profiles, which we promptly reported on the grounds that they were encouraging children to harm themselves. As you can imagine, there was a lot of dark and disturbing posts, but there wasn't much in terms of personal details, so I decided to Google their username to see what came up. And this is the part that always sticks with me. I typed in IX tab, hit enter, and the first search result is a Wikipedia article about a Mayan goddess. I figured the name had come from somewhere, but then suddenly, one word stood out in the description. Ixtab, or Ishtab, is the Mayan goddess of taking one's life, or more specifically, taking your own life by hanging. I know it was obviously a deliberate choice on behalf of the sicko who had been talking to my daughter, but it was terrifying all the same. This person considered themselves the personification of death. My daughter was already halfway down the rabbit hole before we pulled her out again. Speaking of pulling her out, it took a long time and a lot more counseling sessions before we were able to deprogram her. Her counselor insisted that I didn't need to use such extreme language, but that's the way I saw it, the way I still see it to this day. I honestly can't even fathom the kind of evil it would take to do something like that. Trying to talk a vulnerable young woman into taking her own life all apparently inspired by some ancient Mayan goddess. It just sickens me that people like that even exist in the first place. What went so wrong in their lives that they felt the need to do something like that? And the fear that they're continuing to do it is something that still keeps me awake at night. Like I mentioned, we bombarded MySpace and Hotmail with complaint emails and reports, and the accounts we saw ended up getting deleted. But you know just as well as I do, a person can make another account over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if they get banned, they'll find a way around it. 
I find myself hoping, with the deepest sincerity I can possibly convey, that the person who tried to take my daughter from me has a change of heart. I hope whatever dark period they were going through has passed, and that they understand what a terrible thing they were doing. Because if not, there's still a clear and present danger out there, hungry to hurt our kids, and doing so without even laying a finger on them. My grandpa served two tours of Vietnam from 1967 to 1969, but not in the way you might imagine. Personally, when I first learned of his military service, I pictured him wading through the jungle, soundtracked by all along the watchtower or landing in some rice paddy as the door gunner of one of those iconic green transport choppers. But in reality, Grandpa didn't see a single minute of actual combat, and that's because he served in the U.S. Army Quartermaster's Corps. Quartermasters mostly supplied troops with the three Bs, bullets, beans, and bandages. But there's a special department of the AQC known as Graves Registration Service, and that's the unit that Grandpa served in. To save some of you a Google search, the GRS is now known as Mortuary Services, which should give you a better idea of what their work entails. But for clarity's sake, the GRS was tasked with recovering U.S. war dead. The dead men were then examined, identified, and then shipped back wherever home was. My grandpa's job was basically a military mortuary assistant, and he and his buddies worked under an army doctor in determining cause of death, etc. As you can imagine, he and his buddies dealt with a lot of dead bodies, mostly Americans and South Vietnamese, but every so often they got a dead Viet Cong or NVA soldier. This is a very rare event from what I understand, as the enemy often dragged off their dead to obscure casualty figures. But every so often, our boys found a dead communist and whatever was left of them sometimes ended up in front of my grandpa. Now the Vietnamese are a very spiritual people, even with all that no religion communist propaganda they were being fed, the Viet Cong and NVA were highly respectful of what you might call their ancestor spirits. They also have a big role about burying their dead in their respective homelands because failing to do so results in the dead person's spirit being unable to rest. That probably had a big influence on the whole dragging bodies away thing. But the point is, it wasn't very often that GRS found a communist on the table in front of them. Apparently, if the dead guy was Viet Cong, they at least had a chance of IDing the guy based on the fingerprint or dental records of the South Vietnamese prison system. But if the guy was suspected North Vietnamese, there was zero chance of being able to return the body. The North Vietnamese totally denied that any of their soldiers were in South Vietnam, meaning they wouldn't take the bodies, which in turn meant these guys were cremated, boxed up, and then just filed away somewhere in some ARVN intel facility. A far cry from being buried among their ancestors in their home village back in the north. So... My grandpa gets the lowdown on this one day from one of the morticians he's working under, and ever since then, working with the unidentified enemy bodies got decidedly creepy. But then one day, they get this draftee forced on them. The guy's a complete wimp, and couldn't cut it in any combat unit at all, so to punish him, some full bird colonel decided that this tour should be spent working for Graves' registration. If he was just some kind of conscious objector, my grandpa said that he might have at least felt sorry for the guy, but he turned out to be a complete and just utter circus clown. He couldn't do anything right, refuses to try and better himself, and generally proves to just be a pain in the butt. As a result, this kid got all the worst jobs, and one of them was cleaning down any bodies that came in. This was a crappy job for a number of reasons, but one of them was this. In order to properly clean a body, you need to move it around the table, and if it was mostly intact, as in torso and cranium mostly all there, some pretty creepy stuff might actually happen. Corpses sometimes exhale, make noises, sometimes twitch a little, and it takes a hell of a long time to get used to it. We hoped a little incident like that might shock some competency into the kids, so they kept him on body washing duty, hoping that he might give himself a bad case of the heebie-jeebies. He ended up doing just that one evening, only he ended up giving my grandpa and the mortician the heebie-jeebies too. 
Grandpa and the mortician are sitting there, taking a coffee break while Numb Nuts cleans this North Vietnamese soldier's body. And lo and behold, they hear a scream. And the guy comes running out of one of the stations, white as a sheet. Grandpa and his boss milk the hell out of the situation when this idiot told them the NVA guy's corpse had made a noise, telling him it must have been the guy's spirit leaving his body. Well, this guy is on the verge of a total breakdown when Grandpa and his boss finally burst out laughing and then the penny drops that he's the butt of some kind of joke. This only half calms him down, but he's obviously pretty mad that they're making fun of him, so when he mentions that the guy's body was crying... Grandma and his mortician boss think Numbnuts is trying to pull a fast one on him. They call him on his BS, and then this guy insists on it, telling them that they can go look if they don't believe him. So they do. Well, the idiot wasn't making it up to try to scare them back. This corpse was lying there, clean as a whistle, but mincemeat from the knees down. And he was crying. Not like blubbering and sobbering, but his tear ducts were leaking, so much so that the tears were pooling up in the lower depression of his eye socket before they trickled down the sides of his face. Corpses do weird things sometimes, things that'll make your skin crawl, but Grandpa said he'd never seen one cry before. Even the mortician was shaken up by it, so much so that he checked the dead man's pulse just to make sure that he was just that, dead. Obviously, they had to write this up as part of the post-mortem, and when one of the South Vietnamese co-workers got his hands on the report, he came to confirm that this is true. The U.S. Army mortician who's running the operation tells him it's true and that he saw it with his own eyes. They never saw that co-worker again, didn't even stick around to clear out his desk. Grandpa always said that he'd seen way too many dead bodies to believe in ghosts or anything of that nature. He tried his best to be a God-fearing man, but... There's a difference between a belief in heaven and a belief in restless, wandering spirits, one so powerful they can make a corpse cry. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I got a spot about four or five miles deep into a nearby national forest area where I like to hunt. Usually speaking, I'll take a half day off work so I can get dropped off in the early afternoon, and then I'll hike around all weekend before getting picked up at a pre-arranged location. We got all kinds out here too. Hogs, white-tailed deer, black bears, even mountain lions sometimes. There really isn't much I haven't seen out there at some point. So to avoid becoming something's lunch, you'd learn to stay acutely aware of your surroundings. I've had a couple of close calls before now, once with a black bear, once with a mountain lion, but they just left me really shaken up with an increased respect for Mother Nature's monsters. But then there's this one other close encounter I had whilst out there in the woods, one that stayed with me for many years now and one I'm not quite able to explain. It was the middle of November when I trekked out to my usual spot. When I arrived, I set up my tent and my trip wires and got ready for an early night so I could be fresh for the next morning's hunt. I swear I was just on the verge of falling asleep when I hear what sounded an awful lot like a howling wolf. Obviously, there were no wolves in the Carolinas, none that I'm aware of anyway, so I immediately sit up and grab a hold of my rifle. I knew it was more likely a person mimicking their cry, as I doubted it to be a little old me that made a National Geographic level discovery out there in the Smokies. But if it was a person howling like that, and they weren't just doing it out of good spirits, I wanted to make sure that they couldn't, or wouldn't, creep up on my camp. I grabbed my rifle and my binoculars and my bushcraft knife, then simply stood outside my tent for a few minutes, listening out for any signs of them. After a few minutes, I hear the same howling, only way off in the distance this time. So, reassured enough to head back to my sleeping bag, I turn and start heading back to my tent. But then as I turned, I'm almost frightened out of my skin by the sight of a woman, squatting on one of the rocks above my camp. She was sat in such an unnatural way that at first I instinctually unshouldered my rifle in preparation to defend myself, but when I realized it was just some girl, I breathed a huge sigh of relief. I don't mean to sound sexist here, what I really mean is, is I was glad that it was a human and not some mountain lion ready to pounce. 
I reshouldered my rifle and forced out a chuckle as I told her how much she freaked me out. She didn't say anything in reply, she just kept staring down at me with this dumb looking smile on her face. It was around then that I noticed how all her long unwashed hair was almost completely covering her up as she squatted because underneath it didn't look like she was wearing any clothes at all. She kept on smiling as we sort of stared at each other down and continued to stay silent when I asked if she needed any assistance. The only sound she made was this faint giggle as she raised something up in her hand so I could see it. At first, it just looked like a ball of fallen leaves. There were plenty around on the ground for her to grab at, so that's where my head went to first. But then the ball of fallen leaves started twitching and I started to make out a long, fluffy tail wound up among the girl's fingers. It was a squirrel, and it did not sound happy. Any other time I might have cracked some joke about hoping that wasn't all she'd brought for dinner, but at the time, I had a serious sense of humor failure. This girl was really giving me the creeps, and if what she was doing was an attempt to scare me, I didn't appreciate it. I know this might sound a little naive of me in hindsight, but in the moment I felt like I was the butt of someone else's joke. I got a nephew who's obsessed with all those internet pranksters and stuff, the kind that take their pranks way too far on occasion, so my first instinct was to look around for someone secretly recording me. I do a quick 360 to check for anybody, but no one's there. No one I can see anyway, so I turn back to the woman, just in time to see her bringing the squirrel to her mouth. Before I could say anything, I heard this crunch, like a person biting into a stick of celery accompanied by an ungodly screech from the squirrel. I know I shouted something, but I think this comment might get deleted if I say what that thing was. It certainly isn't the kind of comment that a woman might normally find endearing, but the girl spat out the contents of the squirrel's abdomen and let out this loud, ugly cackle. I don't scare easily. I've had one or two brushes with death before and at no point did I figure this crazy little lady was a threat to me, but something in the way she laughed sent a shiver through me. She sounded completely out of her freaking mind, and crazy people do crazy things, like forcing hapless hunters to put a bullet in them by doing something really stupid. I took down my rifle and not pointing it at her directly but rather taking a firm grip of it as if to tell her, stay back lady. I ain't afraid to use this. There was a minute where all I did was stare up at her while she returned my gaze. She had that same dumb smile on her face, only this time her lips and chin were dripping with fresh blood. Last thing I said to her before she took off was something like, You bet the park rangers are going to hear about this. Kind of a Karen thing to say looking back, but it was the first thing that came to mind. The girl gave another cackle spat a wad of bloody spit down at me, which actually almost hit me, and then she ran off through the woods. I'd be right in my first assumption. The woman was near naked as the day she was born, and just as filthy too. It didn't look like she was wearing any footwear, but she must have been because she moved way too fast and confidently to be barefoot out in the woods. When she was at a safe distance, I just went back to being mad again. Mad that someone would find that kind of thing amusing, Mad that they just heard an animal like that to try and give me the creeps, and mad that it actually worked. I told myself that I'd just camp overnight with my knife close in hand and move at first light. I wasn't about to let some monster scare me off my old patch. But when it came to actually bedding down, I knew that there was no way I was getting any sleep. The thought that had me packing up my gear with my head on a swivel was, where are friends? Sure, there are people crazy enough to run around the woods on their own, munching a squirrel's guts in their birthday suits. Hell, she might have been some hotshot tech executive, blowing off some primal steam, I guess. The point is, one crazy person I could handle, two could be trickier, but then three or four of these nutcases coming at me all at once, and in the dark too. I bet you started to see why I noped out of there, huh? Being armed is all well and good, but... All I had was a bolt action and a knife, and since I'm not John Wick, I'd rather not take my chances. I made a point of drastically changing my route for the remainder of the weekend, and part of that new route took me directly to one of the ranger stations, where I told the first ranger I met about what I'd seen. She seemed decently disturbed by what I said, 
just as anyone in their right mind would, and asked if I wouldn't mind sticking around until her superior returned from an errand so I could tell him verbatim what I told her. I figured he'd be just as shocked as his co-worker, but he wasn't. In fact, I wasn't the first person to come to him complaining about crazy naked people running around the woods during the weekend, and on top of that, eating live animals was actually on the less weird scale of things they'd been reported doing. I asked the leader ranger what he meant by that, but he gave me a really cagey answer on it saying that they were trying to deal with the problem and that, to date, they'd never actually hurt any people, just animals. It was only when I was on my way back home that his words struck me as odd. If the park service out there was trying to get a lid on the problem, why did the junior ranger look at me like I was crazy for the first minute or so of me explaining what I'd seen? I guess she could have been new, and even if she had been told, hearing a first-hand account would have still been unsettling. But it still struck me as unusual. I'm actually kind of ashamed to say this, but I hunt someplace else now. It's not so much that I'm scared of those naked folks, it's that I just don't want any trouble. I like my hunting weekends peaceful and quiet, so if it means giving up an old spot for the foreseeable future, then so be it. But you can bet you're behind that if I hear that same human howls echoing around the hills near my new spot, I'll be moving again for good. Okay, so I totally understand if you all think I'm in the wrong in this situation, and I accept that I may have brought this on myself in some way. But that being said, this is the story of one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. I used to play a lot of Call of Duty, like back when trash talking had become an art form. It was also around the same time that people started swatting each other and stuff like that, so there was always a concern that some uber hacker was going to find your address and turn your front yard into Waco. There was like 0.01% chance of that actually happening, but it was still a legitimate concern. Anyways, I was playing this one game with a kid who was admittedly kicking my butt, so I was giving him all kinds of hell over that game chat. Think of the most offensive stuff that you can think of, and I'd find a way to make it even worse before hurling it his way. I called out his mom, his sister, his grandma, his dead dog from when he was a kid, and everything and anything I could think of. Kid just stays quiet. Just keeps owning me, but every so often I get one over him, and I really let him have it. Then, after one really nasty insult combo, he just says, and this is without telling you my name, Hey, you're... And he says my nickname, right? The kid uses my real name, not even my street name. The goofy name my God-fearing mother gave me. I don't keep that crap anywhere near the public face Xbox profile, so the fact that he just knew it felt like a slap to the face. Like I honestly felt myself turn pale as he said it. I kept up trying to front, being all like, nah, that ain't me, I don't know who that is. But then he starts repeating my old address, like my parents, so I figured he'd gotten access to my billing information or something, because I'd only just moved away to college, so... Yeah. Anyway. I'm really shook, but I figured this guy is just using sneaky internet skills to read all the info connected to the billing section, so I'm not too concerned, and I tell him I don't know anyone who lives at the address he mentioned. And then I swear to God, cold as ice, the kid says... Nah, I know your parents live there, and I'm going to drive over there right now and shoot them. Bye. And he leaves the game. And I'm just sat there with the whole rest of the party like, you better call the cops, man. So I did. It would have been different if he'd have been threatening me. I'm not scared to beef. But threatening my mom and dad like that, that's what had me so scared. There are some real psychos out there, and some of them can't handle a little trash talk. And I just seemed to be so lucky as to find one and I'd put my effing parents at risk because of it. I wouldn't normally be one to call 911 so quick either. I'd rather settle things like men, but it's my mom, you know. That made it all different. I called the cops from my dorm room, told them everything that had happened, and they ended up sending some cops over to my parents' place back home in Wisconsin. They took the threat very seriously, especially since this unidentified COD player seemed to know exactly where they lived. 
The cops parked outside my parents' house, stayed there until really early the next morning, then left once they were satisfied that no one was going to show up. Meanwhile, I was able to give the guy's username to the cops, who in turn took it up with Xbox, who must have given them access to the guy's profile because they paid him a visit a few days later. It turns out the reason he knew who I was was because of an old middle school friend who just so happened to be sitting in the room while he was playing, and he could hear me talking on the guy's TV. He must have recognized my username or recognized my voice from the trash talking that I was doing. It turns out maybe I haven't matured since middle school, but that's a whole other thing, and told the guy to ask if it was me. He had no intention of hurting anyone. He just hit the jackpot in finding out my name and my old address. And if I was talking so much trash, why not throw a little back my way? No charges were pressed, and my parents were more mad at me than anything else, so we're all good in that respect. The only thing is, my old buddy's friend's Xbox Live account had been banned as a result, and he's sending me DMs saying it's all my fault and that I need to reverse it. I don't think that it's my fault, and it's his problem for making those threats. So, I'm asking you guys, am I the a-hole in this situation, or is it the other guy? This happened a few months ago. I was driving home from a trip to the store while talking to my friend on the phone at around 9 or 10 p.m. I pull up into my driveway, park, and talk to my friend for a few minutes while I'm sitting in my car. All of a sudden, this sketchy car pulls up directly behind me. There's no way that I could back out without hitting the passenger side of it. It's dark, my driveway lights are kind of dim, and they deliberately turned off the lights of their car when they pulled up behind me but I faintly spotted three guys sitting in it. I'm feeling creeped out at this point, so I asked my friend what I should do, and we both decided that I should wait it out a bit and see if they leave. A few more minutes go by, and they're still there. Eventually, we figured that the best plan of action would be to stay on the phone, calmly grab my bags from the trunk without breaking eye contact with the people in the car, and walk to the door, which is only about 15 feet away. In retrospect, it probably would have been a better idea to just call my parents and ask them to open the door for me inside. I step outside, then grab my stuff from the trunk. The guy in the rear passenger seat of the car cracks their door open and the guy in the front seat is staring me down. They are definitely assessing if I'm a viable target. I kept eye contact with them, but I felt like a deer in headlights. It still felt like ages, but it must have been only two to three seconds at most. Suddenly, the guy in the rear shouts something to his buddies along the lines of, Oh, it's a guy, and shuts the door. And they speed away at like 80 miles per hour on a residential street. I was relieved, but mostly confused. I updated my friend and let them know that I'm alright, then I walked inside. I'm male, 5'9", and slightly overweight with a bit of a baby face, so I don't exactly come across as intimidating to most people I meet, so I doubt I scared them off because of my appearance alone. I'm terrified to think of what could have happened to me if I were a female. It's legitimately really messed up. Why am I safe from those things? Meanwhile, my sister and female friends have no choice to keep guns in their cars, get tiny cans of pepper spray for their keychains, and avoid being alone in general. It's a scary place out there. Whether you're male or female or anything else, always be vigilant. I used to think my neighborhood was relatively safe, but now I'm afraid of sitting in my own driveway at night. I'm a new mom. My daughter means the world to me. And this happened when she was almost one year old. We were in the fruit and veggies section of Fred's. It had been a normal day. Some people waved at her, some smiled. A few others sent kind words her way. My daughter was enjoying interacting with passers-by. But then... Out of the corner of my eye, I see a man trying to communicate with my daughter. He made sounds loud enough to get her attention, but quiet enough that I wouldn't hear. I only saw because he was making some weird kissy face at her as he did it. Something about it felt terribly off. Usually, people will interact with her while making it very obvious to me, but this guy was making an effort to stay just out of my eyesight while keeping his eyes on my daughter. 
I'd never experienced anything like this before, but I was alone and unsure of what to do, so I just left that section of the store and forgot about it. Later on checking out, I saw once more that man. He was right behind me, in the checkout lane next to mine, staring wide-eyed with a blank expression at my daughter. I just froze. I recall the lady checking me out, asking if someone was making me uncomfortable, but I was so shaken up I couldn't get the words out. She called an escort for me, and an employee walked us to the car as I manically scanned the rows of cars. He loaded up my car as I buckled in my daughter and patiently waited till I locked the doors and drove off to go back inside. Perhaps I was overthinking things, but that sense of terror is something I'll never forget. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And thanks a million.